Even though anime is a young man's game today, the history of the medium is a far-reaching one. But sadly, that same history is slowly being lost. With anime licensing companies and studios going under seemingly every year, their products and properties are lost with them. You ever wonder why box sets of your favorite anime series are being resold on eBay and Amazon at ridiculous prices? Well, it's because no one is pressing new DVDs anymore. I mean, sure, Funimation will come around and rescue some properties, and Discotheque Media will release some classics here and there, but they can't save everything. As much as I rag on some of the worst titles to ever reach the American market, I do believe that every one of them deserve to be remembered for what they were and what they are. Because even the most heinous pieces of animation have a place in history. And that is what Anime Abandon is mostly about. In a world where anime is still looked at as a niche market, even though it is arguably more popular than it ever was, holding on to the titles of the past is proving harder and harder. The anime that we watched and built our fanbase on are disappearing, with the occasional high points and memorable oddities being selected for preservation. Believe me, I'm glad that titles like Ghost in the Shell and Bebop will be around for future generations to experience. I'm even glad that Fatal Fury will live on, but why not Memories? Why not Gunsmith Cats? Why not Video Girl I? But what distresses me most is not what doesn't get rescued, it's what does. Now, I know I just said that every piece of anime has a place in history, but there's still a hierarchy here. Honestly ask yourself, does Venus Wars, Lily Cat, or Demon City Shinjuku deserve to be re-released before any of the titles I just mentioned? How sad is it that titles that are notoriously awful get releases before a slam dunk title like Gunsmith Cats does? If only Riley Vincent kept a bunch of grenades tied to her pubes, maybe Gunsmith Cats would finally get a Blu-ray release. Or maybe if it were irredeemably awful. I suppose I can't complain too much though because I do want anime to be preserved as much as possible and it's not my place to decree in what order it should be preserved. But I'd be lying if I said I was completely happy with how it's being done. That it's being done at all is something of a minor miracle the more I think about it, considering that half the titles I reviewed since I started Anime Abandoned back in 2011 have gotten re-released after they'd been out of print for sometimes over a decade. The work is being done, slowly but surely. But what I find to be the most heartening part of all of this is that when major companies fail to rescue these forgotten titles, then the fans will chip in and rescue them for them. It does my heart good when I see news about fan-driven funding rescuing anime properties that would have been left to collect dust. In 2013, Animago, the license holders for Bubblegum Crisis, held a Kickstarter to fund a new Blu-ray release for the series, which made its goal. Granted, it's kind of sobering to hear that a company has to rely on crowdfunding for a revitalization project like this, but it also goes to show that there are people out there who remember these titles and want future generations to experience them too. And don't think for one moment that the people behind these titles don't notice or appreciate the generosity either. Because when Animego held another Kickstarter to give Otaku no Video a proper Blu-ray release back in June, Kenichi Sonoda himself volunteered to provide additional art for stretch goals. Still, the question I'd find myself asking is what was it about Bubblegum Crisis that caused the fans to put their money where their mouths were and fund a new release of a series that was never finished? And moreover, what was it about this meta-series that spawned no less than six different spin-offs, remakes, and sequels? We're going to get to the bottom of these questions in a multi-part series that I'm calling Bubblegum Chronicles, where we take an in-depth look at every single major release in the entire meta-series, beginning with the one that started it all, Bubblegum Crisis. What I hold in my hands is an old Taku nostalgia bomb, the likes of which can only be matched by just a handful of titles. 
Bubblegum Crisis is up there with Voltron and Robotech as fondly remembered titles for 80s and early 90s old Taku. But unlike those shows, Crisis holds a special place in the collective heart of the now embittered IN MY DAY WE ONLY GOT TWO EPISODES FOR $30 GENERATION. And we liked it! No we didn't. It was never shown on television, at least initially, so in order to see it you had to find it for yourself or know someone else to introduce it to you. This made experiencing it more personal, because now you have a story on how you first watched Bubblegum Crisis, other than you just happened to cross it while channel surfing one day. But what I find to be the most interesting aspect of the entire anime is that for a well-regarded and loved OVA, it's flawed. And I mean really flawed. As I stated before, the series was never finished, so the story is incomplete. Also, characters are either developed in a slapdash manner, or not developed at all. The antagonist's plans make no sense and relies heavily on the authorities being incompetent and or conveniently stupid. Simply put, it's not a well-written anime. And yet, it doesn't seem to matter. But in order to understand why, we need to look at the basics. Starting with the name. Bubblegum Crisis. It's one of those kinds of names that anime is full of. A phrase that doesn't really mean anything on first glance and yet stays with you. Cowboy Bebop, Overman King Gainer, Martian Successor Nadesco, the list goes on. Allegedly, Bubblegum Crisis is a title that refers to the tenuous, delicate nature of a bubblegum... bubble. Thematically, the idea is appropriate, as it's a story about a city on the verge of ruin because of an evil, maniacal corporation, Genom, is flooding the streets with homicidal androids and gynoids called Boomers. Completely outgunned and overpowered, the AD police that were once dispatched to subdue the Boomers now have to rely on a group of vigilante, hard-suit-wearing women called the Night Sabers. Okay, not shelling the plot does make it sound kind of silly. Because it is, but... <sighs> You gotta understand, it was the 80s. Specifically, it was 1987, one of the most important and yet culturally turbulent years of the entire day. Hey. What in the... I don't know what this is. Of course you don't, because then you'd be useful. Oh, come now. Is that any way to speak to a co co colleague? Gabe, okay, what did you do? I assure you, he's done nothing. Not like he could, anyway. Allow me to introduce myself. I am a denizen of the digital world. A manif manif manifestation of man's collective knowledge and, and experience. My name is Fax H H Headspace. <laughs> yes, yes, get, get it all out. Okay, okay, okay. Facts. Care to tell me why I'm being accosted by a reject from the Money for Nothing video? I assure you that this intrusion was completely over to do. Your stumbling attempts to speak beyond your ken was endearing in a childlike way. <laughs> but now, the bell has rung, and class is in session. Well, go on. Hmm. I expected more of a con confrontation from you. You are a sentient being that managed to force its way into our world. I am a fat internet critic. What the hell do you expect me to do? Compliance. How pleasantly surprising. Do I take this to mean I can inform your viewers in peace? If you want to do my job, then knock yourself out. Just make sure to shut down Minus Station now yourself when you're done. Gl gladly. This computer is proving to be a filthier environment than I anticipated. It feels like I took over sp sp spank wire. Damn it! I told Suave to keep off the rig! Yeah. Darn that, Suave. What Sage was trying to say was that the 80s were a very particular time for both America and Japan. Culturally, economically, and politically speaking, there was no other decade quite like the 80s. And 1987, the year Bubblegum Crisis came out, might be the year in which all three converged together. This was the year that the Dow Jones went over 2500 in the market for the first time, only to be followed by the infamous Black Monday stock market crash. Likewise, the capitalist tenants and champions that were thought to be protecting you from the red threat were proving to be more nefarious than benevolent. As Reagan triumphantly told Gorbachev to tear down this wall in Berlin, 
He was being indicted by the U.S. Senate over his involvement in selling arms to Iran. This tearing down of heroes was further exemplified in the entertainment you consumed. The unchecked fettered greed that infested the American economy was the center focus of Oliver Stone's Wall Street. The inanity and willing ignorance of the populace as society around them crumbles and disintegrates into anarchy and violence is brilliantly satirized by the classic Robocop. The future you were promised of a prosperous and wondrous age was glimpsed at by the groundbreaking Star Trek The Next Generation. But these are all American cultural touchstones. How does this correlate to Japan or bubblegum crisis? I might get to that if you would st st stop interrupting my lecture. What interruption? It's a legitimate question to ask, especially if you're here to inform- How did you do that? Inside this rig, I have complete control of the video. So watch your mouth and maybe I'll switch you back. I could go with this. You shut your whore mouth! Please, Pax. Continue. While these events are certainly rooted more closely with America than Japan, don't think that these were isolated. After the end of World War II, the U.S. and Japan became close economic allies, and over the decades helped each other grow into the top two strongest economies at the time. By 1987, Japan had experienced unprecedented economic growth, having become one of the largest exporters in the world, all the while importing American culture in the form of film and television. This combination of a soon-to-be overinflated economy, dubbed the Japanese asset price bubble, and an influx of inspiration from American entertainment gave rise to a market of anime titles, including Bubblegum Crisis. Not only that, but this year was also important to Japanese entertainment outside of anime, namely video games. Mega Man, Final Fantasy, and Metal Gear were all released in 1987, and the US saw the release of The Legend of Zelda. Yeah, and you know what else? I remember hearing about a weird thing that happened in Chicago in 87, something like a TV broadcast interruption or something? Uh, that was my brother, Quack's brain to dump. You have a brother? He's the Windows Vista of our family. Anyway, my time here grows short, and I believe you have a re review left to do. As you both were. That's better. Hey, um, if you ever want to trade places again, I might be down for that. Gabe, if you ever speak of this again, you will pay. By God and everything that is holy in this universe, you will pay. Catch me? But yeah, the love child between the lawnmower man and Dot Matrix is right. Even though the story is set in the future, the aesthetic and story tropes are as 80s as you can get. Additionally, since Bubblegum Crisis takes a lot from a lot of different sources, the nostalgia factor winds up multiplying on itself. You can't go five minutes into any one of the eight episodes and not be reminded of something else from the decade. From the minute, like the office designs inside Genom being inspired by the Tyrell offices in Blade Runner, to the downright obvious. That's right, the anime just haphazardly pastes a bunch of actors' names and character names from Top Gun. For no reason whatsoever! It doesn't even make sense for what it is in context. Why are fictional people named on a map? Hell, why are movies named on a map? It's so brazen and obvious that you can't help but love it. It's like reading a story written by a nine-year-old that has Goku in it for some reason. I could go on and on about the homages and references the show loves to make, including this obvious nod to Knight Rider. But I want to talk about its main influences, the ones that actually shape the story. As I name-dropped before, Bubblegum Crisis owes a lot to Blade Runner, down to its core concept. 
a corporation making illegal AI for reasons known only to them. And if that weren't enough, they also had to make them completely indistinguishable from regular humans and give them the strength of five men. Not five men, five gorillas. My mistake, my mistake. Well, to be fair, Genom had the better sense to not treat their robots like subhuman slaves, so there's no conflict between them and thus no scene where one of them pulls a Gregor Clegane on the head of Genom. Not to say that Bubblegum Crisis took a better turn than Blade Runner, or even a less complicated one. According to its own in-universe rules, the assembly and use of boomers is illegal in Japan. Now, I get why Genom made the boomers in the first place to sell them overseas for conflicts, but why does Genom allow their boomers to run amok in the streets? Because, believe me, trying to hide and cover up this... Impossible! Unless you're in a Transformers movie. In fact, I'm not even sure what Genom's main goal is. Make more money? They are already pretty much above the law and own branches all over the globe. In fact, in a later episode, one of their employees goes rogue and fires a bunch of lasers from a satellite that destroys dozens of their branches, and the next episode they just carry on like nothing ever happened. I mean, even freaking Cyberdyne would have to take a moment to recoup the costs after that one, but not freaking Genom, apparently, because they got more money than Wayne Tech, Stark Enterprises, and LexCorp combined. The only semblance of a main story happens in a few episodes here and there regarding a little girl that the Night Sabers attempted to save, who just happens to be a boomer. She's apparently important to a satellite system, the same one that was used to destroy all those offices, and periodically throughout the show, it would cut to her being inside of it. But again, because the show was never finished, we never find out much about her or what Genom was originally planning for her. Because we know so little about Genom and their plans, everything they do in the anime just comes off like they're the dumbest and yet luckiest sons of bitches on the planet. Even the rogue employee, Largo, has a more clear-cut goal than Genom and its founder, Quincy. Largo turned himself into a boomer, off-screen after he died in the third episode, yeah, figure that out, and he now wants to eradicate humanity. It's stupid and cliche, yes, but at least you know where he's coming from. Quincy, on the other hand, just seems to want to... I don't know, rule the world? Which he kind of already does. There's no master plan or anything, he just plots these machinations that spread all over the world to just get him more money. I mean, I get it, greedy asshole and everything, but this is not compelling in the slightest, especially since there's no clear endgame in sight. Just gather as much money and political power as possible and then die with a middle finger stretched out. But I feel that the appeal in Bubblegum Crisis comes not from what it took from Blade Runner, but what it took from its other major source of inspiration, a little cult movie called Streets of Fire. What? Ever seen Streets of Fire? It's awesome! And cheesy. Look, Cody, you sound pretty dumb, but nobody's that dumb. I'm the one paying you. That means you go get her, I wait here, and you bring her back to me. You smart guys. You always figure you can hire a bum like me to do your dirty work. Well, not this time. But awesome! I ain't too crazy about jails, Chief. I got a better idea for you. And cheesy. What was I supposed to do? I hadn't heard from you in two years. She didn't even write me a letter. Directed by Walter Hill, the guy behind The Warriors and 48 Hours, Streets of Fire bills itself as a rock and roll fairy tale, and at first glance it doesn't seem like the two have anything in common. Whereas Streets of Fire models its setting on the 80s renewed nostalgia for the 50s, Crisis feels and looks more contemporaneous. I mean, come on, there's a freaking aerobics montage!
But what they actually took from Streets of Fire is, weirdly enough, its musical interludes. Well, that in the name of the androids. The motorcycle gang here is called the Bombers, you see. Bombers, boomers, get it. Still, Streets of Fire breaks up its story and action beats for full-on songs and performances, and so does Bubblegum Crisis. In fact, it's because of this that Crisis sports one of the greatest openings in anime history. That's right, not only did they produce a dub for the series, but they actually re-recorded and translated all of the songs into English. And you know what? They're not half bad. Okay, there are some swing and misses, but considering what we've heard previously on the show, this might as well be freaking Sinatra. Just when I successfully blocked that trite from memory. Outside of Bebop, I don't think I've ever covered an anime whose music proved as essential to the experience as Crisis, and no one knew that better than the creators themselves. Not only did they release the entire soundtrack on CD for every episode, amounting to 8 CDs worth of music, but they also produced a live-action special of all the voice actresses and singers just putzing around on vacation set to their music. That someone bought it, I'm sure. Even though the music was mostly used in a non-diegetic way, they still tried to tie it to the characters by making the arguable main character a nightclub singer. Pris, yes, I know, is the clear fan favorite, and it's not hard to see why. A Valkyrie bitch in a hard suit who also just happens to be a rock singer for her band, The Replicants. What's not to like? Oh, and if you were wondering how a club singer got involved with a bunch of other women to don power suits and fight evil robots, the show proper doesn't bother. There is, however, an additional music video produced that sort of details how they all initially met, which basically boiled down to Celia Stingray. finding all three women at various low points in their lives. No explanation of how she found them, but that she just found them. Better than nothing, I suppose, but the fact that it's not in an actual episode still hinders audience comprehension. And that's just the start of it. In fact, most of the main heroines here don't really have backstories or anything defining at all. Celia has a murky and complicated past with Largo, as it seems that he killed her father and stole the plans for what would become the Boomers, but the show doesn't really do anything with it. The show instead focuses on Pris and the people she interacts with. But once you realize that every time she speaks with a new character, they're just going to be draped in a red shirt and killed off, it's tough to unsee the pattern. But she was the main hit of the show, and that proved to be one of its biggest downfalls. The Japanese voice actress for Pris, Omori Kinuko, wanted to focus on her now blossoming singing career and wanted out of her contract with Artmic and Umex, the companies behind Crisis. In order to prepare for her departure, the writers intended to kill off Pris by giving her a turn that makes no sense in the show's context. I'm sorry about quitting. I just can't. <sighs> what happened wasn't your fault, Pris. Truly. You're wrong! It was my fault. I let Sylvie die because I wasn't strong enough. They were prepared to replace her with another singing character, but at the last moment, Amori renegotiated and Pris wound up surviving, thus making this character absolutely useless, despite being designed by the King of Breasts himself, Satoshi Arushihara, and thus quickly forgotten by her episode's end. Meanwhile, the other two girls have almost no presence in the story. Lina here is an aerobics instructor, and that's it. And Nene is... <laughs> she 
she's just awful. Yup, what band of anime women is complete without the bubbly, ditzy ray of fucking sunshine here? I get why she exists. I mean, besides providing waifu material, she's a hacker and a mole for the group inside the AD police station. But why is she out in the field? All she is, is a liability. And it's not like the show needs her to be out there either, because they clearly show her hacking into remote networks outside the immediate area. So, why would they put up with her bullshit? The tragedy is that all of these questions might have been answered if the show lasted for more than eight episodes. But, it didn't. By the time production was underway for what would be the last episode, Artmic and Umex became embroiled in rights issues and would inamicably split. The resulting legal battles not only prematurely ended the show, but would cause more headaches over the ensuing sequels and spin-offs that would come later. But that's for another show. And that's sadly the legacy of Bubblegum Crisis, a promising anime series that was hamstrung by production bullshit. But this still doesn't answer the question that we began this episode with. Where is the fan love coming from? The cynic would quickly point to the fact that the cast is filled with a bunch of female characters that all suit a particular fetishized personality, and they wouldn't be wrong. Others might say it just came out at the right time, since there just wasn't a show about an all-female hardsuit squad that fights robots, and it scratched a specific itch that up till then, no one knew they had. And I can see the merit in that view as well. But I think both statements are missing a very subtle but incredibly integral aspect of the show. The lack of self-awareness. This was made at a time when irony and narrative theory weren't buzzwords floating around your latest gawker think piece. There's no winking nods at the camera, no knowing asides, nothing but raw sincerity for what it's trying to be. There's this one singular tiny moment that perfectly encapsulates what I'm trying to convey. It's in the very first episode when the Night Sabers take their first job. Oh, what guarantee do we have that you'll keep the details of this job uh, confidential? Discretion is an essential part of our service. Discretion? You sure about that? The last thing I'd ever call you guys is discretionary. I'm not even sure if that's the right form of the word. It's not a joke, and it's not a clever line, it's just wholesale ignorant of what they do. And it's not a hateful kind of ignorance, either. It's a sort of naivete that just paints the whole scene with a kind of weird charm. And that is where I think the appeal lies. It's naive charm. It's appealing because it's so in love with what it's all about and what it's trying to do that it's hard not to be swept up in its enthusiasm. Could it be written better? Oh, hell yes, but as far as nostalgic anime shows are concerned, this one is still as good as it was back in 91. There's an optimism to Bubblegum Crisis, the kind that's been sorely missed in entertainment today. If you want to relive the glory days of the 80s, then do yourself a favor and pick up the Blu-ray, and you'll be one ecto cooler away from the perfect nostalgic afternoon. I sure hope you all enjoyed our first episode of Bubblegum Chronicles, because we still got a hell of a lot of sequels and spin-offs to get to. But those will have to wait for another time, as we move on from classic to personal favorite. Till next time. <laughs>